All right, I guess we'll get started. Um, thank you all for staying to the final hours of the conference just to see me. I'm tickled. Uh, I promise we're going to have fun here. Uh, well, I promise this will not be the most unfun talk you see this week. Uh, I, I like to use memes, if you may have guessed. And I'm going to use these memes to tell you a story. A story about how we at Salesforce built uh, a developer platform. And as a result, our developers hated us because it was so bad. But we spent the last two years fixing it, making it better. And we improved onboarding time, interloop cycle time. We gave developers tools that, that you know, let them do things they couldn't do before. And today, those same developers still hate us, but at least they're more productive. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, um, real quick, I'm Joe Kuttner, principal architect at Salesforce, uh, working on our internal platform uh, with a focus on developer experience. I spent, uh, before I was working on the internal stuff, uh, I spent about eight years at Heroku uh, as a developer experience architect and really cut my teeth there learning what it makes, what it takes to build uh, tools and experiences that developers really love, that, that delight them. Uh, while I was there, uh, I co-founded uh, the Cloud Native Build Packs project, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, which is a, a CNCF incubating project. We had a kiosk. It's gone. But I'll talk a little bit about how we use it today uh, in, in Hyperforce. So when I refer to our internal developer platform, what I'm really talking about is what we call externally Hyperforce. Now, for our Salesforce customers, uh, Hyperforce is not a developer platform. This is something that underpins all the products that we sell at Salesforce and gives those non-developers or sometimes low-code developers the same benefits of the cloud that we get from developer platforms. Uh, security, compliance, regional availability, all those kinds of things. Internally, when we're building those products, we have our Hyperforce developer platform. So that, that's what I'm going to be referring to, not the external product. Uh, Salesforce likes to name things after itself. So whatever force, Hyperforce, Dreamforce is our big conference in San Francisco that shuts down the city for a week every year. We just launched AgentForce, an AI platform. But today, we're going to talk about a fictional product called MemeForce. MemeForce combines the latest in AI technology with the best memes in the industry so we can give these to our customers, right? Really important stuff. This, I, I want to repeat, this is a fake product, not a real product. Uh, but MemeForce, in order to get integrated with all the other Salesforce products, they need to get onto Hyperforce. Uh, so just to help you understand this, uh, if you have a dashboard with some metrics, some API response times and things like that, if things start going south, you know, services aren't responding, you'll get a meme that says, you know, hang in there. And if things get really bad, you're in a crash loop, sub zero, it's okay, at least you tried. So you can see how important this is to our customers. So uh, MemeForce, about two years ago, started onboarding to Hyperforce. They're really excited. They're going to, you know, change the world, big product. But what they started to find out was that they were actually onboarding to a lot of different platforms, not one platform. They had a CI platform that they had to learn and configure, a CD platform, an infrastructure as code platform, a monitoring platform, and so on and so on and so on. Everybody gets a platform, right? So what this ended up meaning for them was that they had to learn different interfaces, different tools, and then wire them all together themselves. So for them, it was actually more of a documentation-driven experience. They, the, we had optimized the platform for the implementers of the platform. You know, it's great when you have this nice little silo to work in, and like my problem space is CD, and I don't have to worry about how this, the artifacts from CI get here, right? So it was up to MemeForce to figure out how to put all these things together. And they did it. They got it working. But even once they were onboarded, you know, on day two, it was still a problem, because if there was a, a runtime issue, they had to figure out if it was the Kubernetes platform or the networking platform or the telemetry platform, because those things weren't talking to each other. We didn't have technical components that were integrating these different platforms. So MemeForce was excited to be on uh, Hyperforce. You know, they were looking forward to it, but once they got there, they realized they just weren't getting that developer productivity hug that they were, that they were hoping for. And their, their innovation, their speed of innovation slowed down. Their ability to, to deliver new features and products uh, was diminished. So we had to do something about this. The problem is that when we first built Hyperforce, this internal platform, all of our emphasis, all of our energy went into security, compliance, availability, cost to serve. These are all really important things. Like we can't do business without them, but we did not invest in developer productivity. 
And as a result, teams like MemeForce and, and across, our, uh, across our business were starting to slow down. So that's two years ago. We recognized it, and we decided we had to make a change. The thing we realized was that we took the complicated issues and we pushed them onto our end users, our service, service owners. If there's one thing that you take away from this talk today, it, it's this, that keeping it simple for your developers, the developers using your platform, requires that you make it complicated for yourself. This is inevitable in building a developer platform. You have to take those complex concerns, the complicated things, and manage them for your user. That's what gives them leverage. So we fast forward a couple years. Uh, MemeForce has a new product. It's called the Humor Engine, AI-generated jokes. We don't even need comedians anymore. They'll just be generated for you. It's really exciting, right? Like, our customers are going to love this. But MemeForce thinks, you know, that was a real pain getting onto Hyperforce. Why should we even do it? Like, I can go into the AWS console, just provision out some stuff, use it. I can be up and running in a day, maybe even into prod in a week, right? So why even use a platform? Well, they think about that for like a minute, and then they're like, yeah, but we got to go into Asia and Australia and South America. And actually, AWS isn't the only substrate we run on. We have to go into Alibaba and GCP. And then we want to do FedRAMP and Eurozone, and we have to learn about like these things. These are all the compliance standards we need to adhere to to do business with the government, banks, insurance companies, and like, I'll be honest, I don't know what those are. But that's why platforms exist, right? The platform is there to provide leverage for compliance, security, all of those things, so that our developers don't have to. The developers, MemeForce developers, should be contributing above the value line. So I mean, every line of code, every you know, technical thing they work on should be implementing new features and products that add value for our customers. Anytime they're working on compliance or some operational toil, they're contributing below the value line. So um, MemeForce, as they onboarded the Humor Engine, uh, we're delighted to find that in the last two years, we'd really changed some things. We built some new interfaces. We started using APIs from all of those previous platforms. Uh, and their experience was quite changed. One of the things that we did um, was borrow uh, technology and ideas from our subsidiary, Heroku. Uh, it's a business unit of Salesforce. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's a cloud-based platform for running your apps in the cloud. Uh, it's an external, external customer-facing product, although we do run a lot of Salesforce's business on Heroku. Uh, our internal platform is tailored more to our internal concerns, but we do use a lot of Heroku technology. Uh, but as you guessed, like, we didn't necessarily use the same developer experience principles the first go-around. So I'd like to talk about five of the principles that we took from Heroku to, to help redesign this uh, internal Hyperforce platform. I'll go over them one by one. So the first one is having unified interfaces. As I mentioned, when we had all these different uh, individual platforms, they each had their own, in some cases, like CLI. Like they built their own CLI. Some of them just had a bunch of shell scripts that they would give people. Uh, you know, they're all variations of how you configured and used it. Some of them even had their own web interface, uh, their own GitOps interface. And worst of all, they all had their own notification system. So like a developer using the platform would get emails and Slack messages and pager duty alerts from all over. Uh, and it was hard to correlate. If there was a single problem, they might get a whole bunch of notifications that were related, but they're coming in from different places. So we built a single notification API that functioned as like a choke point where developers could configure, I want these notifications to go to Slack and these notifications to go to PagerDuty. So all of these interfaces uh, were backed by APIs. Uh, that was important because the individual platforms, when they were operating on their own, it was very easy for them to have manual steps for onboarding or manual steps to require rate limit increases, things like that. But now that we're putting this behind uh, you know, a unified interface layer, we needed to remove those, um, those manual processes. Uh, but we didn't go API first. We went API second. I'm kind of trolling, but I'm kind of serious. Uh, like, I've, I've been at places where we were doing API first, and we built these great APIs, and then they didn't actually do the thing we needed to do, right? I think it's important that the experience precede everything else in the design. Your experience should drive the APIs that you build. They should define the information architecture and the user journeys that those APIs support. So yeah, API first, but you know, after the experience. So the second principle we borrowed from Heroku was having extension points. In fact, I'd argue that if, if your platform does not have 
well-constructed formal extension points, then it's not really a platform. Like if you think about any, even like you know, your phone, uh, iOS or Android, apps that plug into that platform are using these APIs to add new capabilities, a calendar, a phone, a game, through a set of common interfaces, gestures, touches, whatever. And the cloud is no different, right? Uh, these extension points are how we scale by, when we add new capabilities. It's also how customers can extend the platform at times, too. So the first place we did this is in our CLI. So we built a CLI, a single unified CLI, but we didn't want to have a single core CLI team that was sort of blocking the business and reviewing PRs and everybody had to contribute to that. So we built a plugin framework for that CLI. Um, there's an open source framework actually that came from Heroku called Oakliff that does exactly this. So if you build on, uh, a CLI using the Oakliff framework, it already has plugins. Uh, our internal Hyperforce CLI is written in Golang and uses HashiCorp Go plugins. So we sort of built our own interface there. But what it's done is allowed our monitoring team and our Kubernetes team and our CI team to build their own CLIs or at least have autonomy over the commands that they build, but to plug them into our CLI framework in a way that our customers don't recognize that there's different teams actually building them. Uh, build packs are another extension point. I'll talk about those in a second. The notifications API I talked about is both an interface and an extension point. And then finally, uh, we created uh, something called add-ons, which are based on Heroku add-ons. So Heroku add-ons, if you're not familiar with them, uh, are a module that encapsulates all the concerns associated with a particular backing resource. Uh, so a backing resource could be something like a database or a caching service or an APM, anything that you would consume as part of your service in its regular operation. And the purpose of an add-on is to take all the things that a developer would otherwise have to do, uh, like provisioning, patching, updating, monitoring, scaling, even decommissioning, and put that behind an encapsulation layer, right? And there's many ways you can do this. Heroku has its own proprietary thing that uh, is designed to work with external third-party vendors. Uh, we didn't have that internally, so we used uh, a sort of simpler Terraform-based approach. But at the end of the day, what we get are building blocks that our developers compose their app from. Uh, this allows them to focus on what they want and not how they get it. So what they want is an S3 bucket with a particular name, and how they get it is the Terraform and the pipelines and some kube operators and things like that, right? So again, this is our internal system. If you're looking for something for your platforms, uh, Backstage sort of fits into this area. Um, if, you're, if you're using Backstage, though, remember to treat it as part of your platform, not a separate platform. You can do that with open source, too. Also, um, I read a blog post uh, about something called Crow, and I don't know a whole lot about it, but it really seems like another solution that fits into this area. Uh, I was just reading through this. Uh, they describe it as encapsulating a Crow, I guess, package encapsulates all the necessary resources uh, for a particular application type. So there's a lot of options out here. It's up to you and, and, and your platforms to determine what makes the most sense for your, for your users. Uh, the other extension point we use uh, are build packs. Uh, so we use build packs in the same way that uh, Heroku does uh, for taking source code and turning it into a container image that runs in a, in a cluster, and, and that's your app. Uh, but we also use build packs uh, in a way that I affectionately call hyper packs, where we run alongside either your Dockerfile build or your build pack build, uh, and we scan your service to determine what uh, Terraform it's needed, uh, what Helm chart you might use. Uh, some of our developers don't even see their own Helm chart. Uh, and other types of configuration and infrastructure as code. And then from that, we produce uh, a container image that represents all the provisioning uh, and configuration things that are needed to like reconstitute that service from scratch if we need to. But in any case, these build packs, uh, they have a well-defined interface. Uh, they're, mod they're modular, so you can plug them in. And they provide a great way for each of those former platform teams, the CD team and the, the monitoring platform, to sort of plug in processes to our CI uh, our CI pipelines, right? So they can plug in validation, that's very common, so they can left shift validation so that developers uh, are finding out that they've done something wrong before they actually deploy into a cluster. Um, they can also do things like generate default configurations, default Terraform even, um, so that developers don't have to do it themselves. All right, the next uh, principle that we borrowed from Heroku is meet developers where they are, uh, which can kind of be summed up as use industry standard tooling, which I know is like, Duh, that's like why you're here. It's like learn about these industry standard tools, right? But it does get tricky. Um, and I think a good example of this is how we give uh, kubectl access to our, uh, to our developers. Um, we, we didn't want to like paper over and abstract away that CLI, but um, 
we also didn't want to give them the full power of doing whatever they could do with the cluster. Like we are managing it for them. So we found like this middle ground of giving them read-only access and then sort of scope to only what we would allow them to do. Uh, similar thing with uh, Helm. Like I mentioned, uh, many of our uh, service owners that are deploying on the platform are we're using Helm to do that, but they never see their Helm chart, right? Now, every time we've gone wrong in our developer experience um, is where we've gone bespoke, where we invented something new, where we designed a new technology that didn't fit into the industry. Uh, and sometimes that's just as simple as interfaces. Uh, you know, for example, we really, we've gone in all in sort of on the GitHub interface and GitHub checks and, and meeting developers where they are, which is, you know, a lot of the time in, in GitHub. So coming back to the Helm chart, um, some of our developers do want access to their Helm chart and they want to customize it. And this is where it was important for us not to create too strong of an abstraction, because really strong abstractions that aren't quite right or, or don't always fit every use case, when a developer has to eject from that abstraction, they suddenly get exposed to all of the complexity that the abstraction was trying to hide, right? Uh, we call that a cliff in the experience, right? You're, you're, you're humming along, everything's working great, and then you need to change one configuration variable, and all of a sudden, you've just owned the whole, the whole Helm chart or the whole Terraform module or whatever. So what we aim to do in our platform is reveal complexity gradually. Uh, we allow developers to get access to the more complex configurations and APIs, but only at the granularity that's right for them. The inspiration for this came from a blog post written by uh, Jean Yang, who I think is head of product at Post. Postman right now. Um, she's written a lot about uh, developer experience. Uh, and in this particular post, she argues against abstractions. Um, and she talks a lot about how, as software implementers, we often reach for abstractions as a silver bullet you know, to solve all the problems. But the reality is, especially with these cloud platforms, they are complex. And at the end of the day, when you need to get into that complexity because you have a runtime issue or you're trying to solve a problem, you're either going to be you know, thrown off the cliff and suddenly exposed to all of it, or it can be exposed to you gradually, right? So we really aim less for big, strong abstractions and more for smaller, weaker abstractions. An example of this is how we do multi-substrate. Um, so we encourage our, uh, our developers to use things like uh, GoCloud CDK, which provides higher level interfaces over things like object storage. So you can use them uh, like across GCP and AWS, uh, as sort of an abstraction layer. Uh, works great a lot of time, uh, but there are cases where our developers need access to substrate specific APIs, substrate specific libraries. And so for this, we use a directory structure based approach where they can put substrate specific .go file or, or, or business logic in there, and then our CI pipelines handle sorting that out and which, um, which version of their code is gonna go to which substrate. Um, we also we do a very similar thing for Terraform and some of our deployment pipelines where, by and large, it's abstracted from them, but they can provide these little pieces of substrate-specific logic. Okay, the, uh, the last principle that we borrowed from Heroku is called ephemeralization. Uh, this was popularized in the 1950s by Buckminster Fuller, who has a fantastic name, uh, but his, his thesis was, Technology is successful when it allows you to do more and more with less and less until eventually you can do everything with nothing. And I know that kind of sounds like hyperbole, right? But there's really good examples of this. Uh, I like to talk about uh, how we used to go see movies or like, I guess how our parents used to go see movies. Like they'd go to a theater and there'd be a reel-to-reel -reel projector. And then eventually we compressed that down into VHS and then we went digital. And today we're streaming, right? Like just hit a button, watch whatever you want. And there's no physical medium, so you can watch any movie with nothing. Uh, there's other great examples like how we measure distance to things. It used to use tape measures, and then we got lasers, and now we have GPS, everything with nothing. I think in our industry, the best example is the command that made Heroku famous, git push Heroku main. Uh, didn't even require that you install a CLI. You just take the, git, uh, the Heroku git remote URL, add it to your git, remote, uh, your git remotes, and then you push to it. And in a post receive hook, uh, Heroku will compile your code, install your dependencies, build a container image, and run it on the platform. Everything you need to do to run an app in the cloud with nothing, not even uh, its own CLI. And that's the experience we were really striving for uh, in rebuilding our, our Hyperforce platform. So the MeanForce team was delighted to find that all these unified interfaces, which were backed by APIs, 
you know, really was working better for them. And I'll walk you through some of the, the steps they used uh, to get there. Uh, so the first thing that they did uh, was actually before they did anything specific to Hyperforce, which internally we call Falcon. Uh, so the CLI for our internal Hyperforce developers is called the Falcon CLI. You'll see it mentioned here a couple times. Um, but the first thing they did before any of that was actually just build a Python Flask app, right? It's a standard Python Flask app. It does Python things and AI things and makes jokes, right? They got it working locally. We didn't want them to have to tailor their app to our platform. We wanted to meet them where they are. So they ran Falcon init, which bootstrapped a service on the platform by detecting what their app was composed of. So that command determined that this is a Python app, so I can set up CI in an appropriate way. It created a GitHub repo for them, because they didn't have one already. Uh, it set up their GitOps configuration. Uh, so it, we're all in on GitOps. Uh, so everything that they need to configure about the platform goes into a single directory in their app. We initialize that for them. We initialize some of these uh, basic add-ons that do the, the Helm and Terraform things that I mentioned earlier. And we even bootstrap their integration test harness, which is actually one of the more difficult things to do in our, in our platform is make sure you're testing and integrating with all the different services that, that we offer. So after that, they had some, they had a diff on their local file system, and they ran git push Heroku main. And then that's when CI picked up their, their new GitOps directory, uh, picked up their add-ons and started to unfurl them and expand them out into all the infrastructure as code and pipelines and, and Helm charts and things like that. It created artifacts from those, some container images, then it notified our control plane, which is behind that unified interface layer, which started sending all those configurations off to those, what were previously their own platforms. But they now have APIs, so we send those configurations to them. They issue events back through that notification API when they finally realize that configuration. In some cases, you know, they have to do like hydration and actually call AWS APIs to, to make some identity change or whatever it may be. Once all those uh, events are sent through the notification API, the, the control plane collects them, and it knows that that single git commit is now, been, is now ready to be deployed. And that starts the continuous deployment process, sends the, uh, the actual like, container image artifacts through the CD process, and gets them running in a cluster. All that said, at the end of this git push Falcon main, uh, they have an app running in, in our platform. They get to track all of this in a web portal that brings all those statuses from the events uh, emitted by the previously independent platforms uh, in what we call an activity view. And each row in this activity view corresponds to uh, a pull request. When that, in the previous system where we had the, the distinct platforms for every capability, they all had their own version of like whatever you were doing. This is your CI version, this is your CD version, this is your infrastructure as code version, it's 1.2.5. Uh, and, you know, kind of like getting some coherence between those was, was really difficult. So what we did with this interface, again, is meet them where they are in GitHub and use the git SHA for that commit as sort of a, like, almost like a trace ID across every one of these systems, right? Now when you go look in GitHub and you look at the SHA for a particular commit, you can track that all the way through the networking system, the managed Kubernetes system, the, the monitoring system that you just configured, and you can know exactly what is running and, and where. But in any case, this is where they, um, they can actually get a better visualization of, of their CI and CD processes and how we're realizing those configurations. After they're up and running, they want to iterate on their app. They want to start adding databases and S3 buckets and things like that. They use the same CLI to run Falcon add-ons init, uh, and then the type of resource that they want. So this might be RDS or S3 or DynamoDB. Uh, we also have... Uh, uh, substrate agnostic uh, add-ons like object storage that work across substrates. In any case, when they run this command, the CLI will prompt them for just a few questions. In fact, when you're doing this with an S3 bucket, you get one question, what's the name of the bucket? And at the end of it, it generates a manifest, uh, sometimes just a few lines of code that say the version of the add-on and then the name of the bucket in that case. So that's what, that's what the developer sees. They see what they want, which is an S3 bucket with a partic particular name, and then when CI picks up that add-on, it unfurls it and uh, creates all the, the how you get that thing. Uh, so most of the developers' interaction uh, as they're building up their app, as they're composing it from these building blocks, is, is through adding these add-ons to their, to their service. So uh, MemeForce, I'll remind you, is a fictional product. But if they were a real product, and these are actual numbers from real services that uh, have built on our platform, 
Their onboarding speed would have been 85% faster compared to two years ago. Uh, their inner loop cycle time, so the, the work that they do on code before they ever make a commit was six times faster, in part because we enabled things that they couldn't do before. And then they saw a 55% reduction in release failures. When they were deploying across all those different platforms, uh, release failures were, were very frequent because you're essentially coordinating a release across many different platforms. We know these numbers because we always check our measurements. We don't want an 18-inch Stonehenge. But measuring developer productivity is really hard because it's like, it's like a soft thing, right? Uh, and I, there's some frameworks out there. There's Dora, uh, and then there's the space framework. And this is what we've standardized on. So kind of coming into the second part of the talk here, uh, I'm gonna talk about how we measure all the, the productivity improvements that we've made. Uh, so this space framework came, or was made popular uh, by N Nicole Fors Forsgreen at Microsoft and her team of researchers. They published this article in ACMQ, I think a couple years ago. Um, that date might be down here. No, it's not. Um, but there's a, there's a lot in here about how we can me better measure developer productivity and defining a framework for that. But the central thesis is that you cannot boil down productivity to a single metric or a single dimension. Uh, it has to be... A, a measurement across many dimensions. And I think this comes back to like why we all pretty much don't think the 10x developer thing is a, a great uh, way to measure. It's like a very one-dimensional thing, right? Like 10x what? 10x number of commits? I don't know. Um, so the space framework is actually, or space is actually an acronym, and it stands for satisfaction, productivity, activity, collaboration, and efficiency. These are the dimensions that they advocate, you know, should be the, the key elements of measuring productivity. The, uh, the ACMQ article talks about what these mean, but it doesn't actually prescribe any mechanisms that are required to instrument and, and, uh, and measure and you know, define these measures. So it's kind of up to each organization to determine how they're gonna do that. So I'll, I'll tell you how we're doing it in Salesforce. Uh, in addition to collecting the metrics, we also built a dashboard for individual developers, teams, the whole organization to go look at and see how they're, how they're doing over time, how they're doing on each of these different dimensions. So on that dashboard, we have five tabs. Uh, the first one is satisfaction. Uh, and, and this is pretty straightforward. Uh, we measure this based on surveys. So we ask developers, how are they feeling? How do they feel productive? And to be honest, I think this is actually the most important metric we have. A developer's own assessment of their productivity uh, is, is the most uh, accurate measure of their productivity, right? Um, I think developers all know when uh, there's friction in the processes and, and when they're being slowed down. But we also measure it at the team level, not just the individual level, uh, using sprint retro evaluations and things like that. We give them a score of one to five, and then they can see how they're doing over time. Uh, the next dimension is productivity. Uh, this is essentially cycle time. So we measure both inner loop cycle time, uh, the time from starting a task or uh, you know, a work item until they make their first commit or PR, right? And that, that process of making code changes locally and iterating on them, uh, greatly affects their, their productivity. We also measure the outer loop cycle time, so from that commit to a production branch, when CI starts and then it goes through that CD process, how long does that take? Because that definitely can slow people down. At the team level, uh, we use P80 for uh, C, CI build time and then P80 for deploy time as well. For activity, uh, the A in space, uh, we measure the number of PRs and the number of bug fixes uh, in a sprint per individual developer. Boy, let me tell you, this is controversial. Because uh, definitely, like, you know, different individuals and different teams have different cadences. So we don't use this at the individual level. We do collect it there and then roll it up, right? We're not using these numbers to, like, stack rank developers or anything like that. But we do encourage teams to go look at their own numbers and, and try to understand where their bottlenecks are. Uh, at the team level, uh, we use deployment frequency as a measure of activity. The C is for collaboration. Uh, this is also one of my favorite ones. We measure uh, the number of PR reviews uh, and then the time it takes to pick up a PR. Because, uh, of course, you know, if you're sitting there waiting for a PR, that's, that's bad. Um, but, uh, yeah, this is a good measure of how individuals are working together on a team, which is certainly a great you know, measure of, uh, of developers. At the team level, we measure the distribution of PRs across the team. So is it just one person uh, reviewing PRs, or is, that, uh, is it spread more evenly? For efficiency, uh, we actually use developers' calendars uh, to see how many meetings they have, how much focus time they have. Uh, we also track wait time for reviews. I know at other organizations, and I believe, uh, uh, I, think, I think Microsoft does this, they actually instrument the de developers' workstations to determine how uh, 
like how long the IDE is in focus and use that information. But again, I think these, these are all kinds of things that can be misused, but they're important for us to understand if we're making the right investments and uh, where we need to make improvements. So a really good example of this is the first time we set up these dashboards and started collecting these metrics, um, it really stood out to us that interloop cycle time was like real bad. Like people couldn't even do it, right? There was actually, it was actually difficult to have code running locally that simulated the, something that was working across all of these different uh, individual platforms, right? So we invested in um, some of our own uh, tools that allow you to build container images locally and then run them uh, in a dev cluster without going through a CI CD process. And we also integrated technologies like uh, telepresence. And that's how we saw that 6x improvement in interloop cycle time. So that's just a great example of where we used these metrics to figure out where we needed to invest. And then we saw the improvement. And then we showed the executives, and they were happy. So. OK, so just to recap, uh, the values that we brought from Heroku that really defined our, uh, our re-implementation of the platform were unified interfaces, single CLI, single web interface, but also making sure that those interfaces have extension points um, so that you're not bottlenecking uh, all of your developer experience on uh, individual teams that own a CLI or a web portal. Uh, meet developers where they are. Figure out where your developers are spending most of their time, if it's in a particular programming language or an IDE or a GitHub, and plug in all of your, uh, your capabilities to that. Use in industry standard tooling. Don't paper over, create abstractions on top of things if they're not quite right for you, because you're, you're, you're taking away leverage from developers, right? Let them use Stack Overflow to learn about Kubernetes and Helm if they need to. Reveal complexity gradually. Uh, a lot of the technologies that you've probably learned about this week are complicated. Um, they're important for us as we're building platforms, but we don't always want to expose these to the end user in all of their horror and complexity. Give, but don't completely paper over them again. And then finally, is ephemer, ephem, ephemeralization. Uh, every product, every feature you deliver should allow your end users to do more with less. And of course, the space metrics. Um, I, uh, I'll have the link to the, uh, that actual ACMQ article in the slides. And there's actually some follow-up research uh, that's been published in other places, too, and that'll be in the speaker notes. So one last call to action. Um, there's a, a, a project called the 12-Factor App. Uh, who's heard of the 12-Factor App? Whoa. All right. Yeah, so uh, it was created a little over 10 years ago at Heroku to help uh, the Heroku customers understand what, how their apps needed to be shaped, what the contract was with the platform in order to get running in the cloud. And it's been really valuable for, for more than 10 years. But a lot has changed, right? Um, there's this cloud-native ecosystem, and we, we want to reconcile the 12-factor app with all these new cloud-native technologies. This is not exactly the same as the values that I talked about that we borrowed from Heroku, but there's quite a bit of overlap and I think inspiration between the two. So if you're looking to learn more about where these values come from and even contribute back to us uh, refreshing the 12-factor app, uh, there's a link down here below about how you can get involved uh, and join us as we start to kind of redefine this, this manifesto, this methodology for the cloud native ecosystem. Cool, so uh, thank you. I hope you enjoyed the memes, and uh, I, hope, I hope you get more productive. Um, I do have uh, just a couple minutes for questions, if anybody has them. Yeah. yeah hi, great talk. Thank you very much. Uh, how many engineers were involved in developing and maintaining this amazing platform? Yeah, good question. So we have our, so our customer base is in the order of thousands of uh, end users, service owners. Uh, I think it's a little under, it's like 8,000 or something like that. Internally, um, there's a very large number. Uh, my organization is about 400 to 500 people. They weren't all working exclusively on developer experience. Some of them were just building uh, core components of uh, CI and, and CD and things like that. The developer experience layer, though, um, see, I think there were, there are three or four teams that are devoted to those develop that developer experience layer, and there's about 50 of them in total. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I have a question. Uh, if you have given, uh, <clears throat> have any experience or collected metrics around the day two experience, like how painful was for your developers? 
to integrate a new feature onto already existing surveys or launching it. Sorry, can, then, can you repeat the first part? I didn't, I didn't catch the first part. So did you measure anything around the, the day two experience? Oh, the day two experience. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, we do. And that's really it, it, the, it, the other parts of this, uh, these loops, right? Inner loop is the, uh, I explained that already, outer loop is CI and CD. And then scale loop is really largely about what we call day two experience. We kind of moved away from day two because, uh, but this is where things like uh, monitoring and release frequency and things like that. Um, so yeah, we c I can talk after and explain some of the specifics that we measure there, but we, that's why we broke it out into these three different loops. Yep. Yeah. I have a quick question again. Mm -hmm. uh, just uh, for the interfaces side, you talk about creating the right abstraction. How many iterations does it require in your experience to get a right abstraction to the, uh, bring it to the user? Yeah, I'll, I'll let you know when we find out. <laughs> <laughs> No, we're always continuously improving, and uh, yeah, um, it's never perfect. I think that's why our developers still hate us, but uh, I, you know, that's why our own velocity is, is such an important uh, aspect of, of building the plugins and things like that, too. So. Hey, so I'm actually from a pretty old company that has a lot of stuff that developers built themselves and has a lot of sprawl, and there's a lot of NIH syndrome going on, right? Do you have any recommendations on how to sell something like Backstage where we could pull it all together um, to people who have basically written this and it's their baby, right? Yeah, I mean, that sounds similar to like the Heroku add-ons marketplace. Is that, is that what you're thinking in terms of like the, like the actual modules that would be? No, 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 like, like, it, like we have a, a team that did platform engineering, and uh -huh. instead of utilizing off-the-shelf industry standard components, just built it all themselves, right? And it's not extensible, it isn't maintainable. Oh, oh, okay, right? I see. And so you want, your, your, your goal then is to migrate to like the cloud native ecosystem components from those bespoke things? Yeah, so, exactly, right? Yeah. Something that's more extensable and more maintainable. Yeah, um, you know, as I mentioned, like, uh, We've done, we've, we definitely had components that were bespoke and, and our own. Um, in some cases, we, uh, we did like basically a strangler pattern where behind, behind the interface of that bespoke thing, we started uh, introducing things like Argo CD and, and whatever, and, but maintained our, our bespoke interface and eventually are now like sort of cutting that out and giving people, this is part of the revealing complexity gradually, giving people access to the, the lower level configurations and the YAML files and things like that. So I mean, I, my, I guess my answer would be a strangler pattern, if, that's, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. So, happy to talk about it later, too. Uh, I think I'm out of time, so, but I'll, I'll be happy to stick around and take, uh, take questions uh, offline.